Now that we know a bit more about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and the studies that led to our discovery of these subatomic particles, we're going to move forward to seeing how atoms combine to form compounds. And the first class of compounds that we're going to look at here are called ionic compounds, which are held together based on different atoms gaining either positive or negative charges, and then those atoms combining based on those charges to make something that is overall neutral. Uh, we're going to take a look at several rules that are going to determine how the different particles have certain known charges that they prefer to take and why they take those charges, as well as how different numbers of atoms are going to combine to give an overall ionic compound that are neutral, right? Uh, we learned about the protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we saw that the protons are the positive charged species and the electrons are the negatively charged species. And what we're going to see is that because the electrons are what resides outside of the nucleus on the outer parts of the atom, it's going to be gaining or losing those electrons that turn a neutral atom into a charged particle, which we'll call an ion, whether it's positive or negative charged. Uh, finally, we're going to look at how some ions are actually collections of atoms that are bound together by non-ionic forces to give a single package that's going to act as if it were also a single ion. And we're going to see how those, what we call polyatomic ions, are very important to understanding how ionic compounds form as well. Uh, so with that, let's get into the video. All right, so here we have an image of a covalent compound, right, a molecule, CO2, a molecule we should be pretty well familiar with already. So we have an image here of three different carbon dioxide molecules. And what we can see is that the lines that are joining the black carbon circles to the red oxygen circles, those are covalent bonds, right? That's bonds between these atoms. But between the different molecules, right, between one package of CO2 and another package of CO2, we don't have a covalent bond. Uh, there's some other type of force that we'll discuss later in chemistry. But the point is that that's characteristically very different from our ionic compound, where, for example, NaCl, so this is just a sodium chloride table salt, we have sodium and chloride existing in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? This NaCl structure for ionic compounds indicates that there's one chloride for one sodium ion. But there's no distinction between the different units, right? The different formula units of NaCl. They exist as a crystal lattice where we just simply have sodium and chloride that exist together in a repeating structure where that structure is held together by the fact that we have equivalent charge from the positive and the negative ions. So difference in these bonding motifs really critical later in chemistry and something worth highlighting now. We will be delving more deeply into the ionic structure here and covalent structure we'll study more in depth later in the chemistry course. And one thing that's really critical for understanding ionic compounds is understanding, well, what charge is an ion going to take if it's in an ionic compound? And so uh, let's focus first on the noble gases, right, all the way on the right side of the periodic table. And note that these don't take a charge. These generally will not react with anything. And so that's because they have a stable electron structure. They don't want to gain or lose any electrons, which is uh, the real thing that's going on when we're forming ions, right? To form a negative ion means we've gained an electron, and to form a positive ion means we lose an electron. Forming a negative two ion means we gain two electrons, right? Forming a positive two ion means we've lost two electrons. And so that's what we see from the periodic table. Noble gases don't form ions, right? But the other ones will generally want to gain or lose electrons to be like a noble gas. So for example, oxygen has two fewer electrons than neon, but it can gain two electrons to become like neon, right? And hence oxide, the oxygen anion, has a charge of minus two. Take a look at fluoride, right? Fluorine has one fewer electron than neon, and so if it gains an electron, it'll be just like neon. And therefore, we can see this repeating pattern in the periodic table where if we have elements that are non-metals generally on the right side, they'll gain electrons to be like a noble gas, while metals on the left side will lose electrons to be like a noble gas. In the middle, we have elements that would need to gain or lose too many electrons to be like a noble gas, and so they end up finding certain stable ionic charges that aren't quite as highly charged as you know, losing five or six electrons, right? Uh, and so when it comes to the transition metals, 
those you'll generally uh, need to know what the charge on those are. Or in some cases, they form just a single ion like zinc that only forms the two plus ion. Uh, these are a little bit harder to track and just pretty much need to be memorized. So let's take a look at the following question. Please pause the video here if you'd like to register your answer before moving on. All right, so the question here is, what is the charge on lead in the following compound, PbCl4? And how do we figure this out? Well, lead is a transition metal, and so we may not know what the charge on lead would be. However, chloride, Cl, uh, we know is a halogen. It's one uh, over from the noble gases. And so we know that chloride, Cl, minus, will have a minus one charge, right? Because by gaining one electron, it'll be like a noble gas. And we also know that there are four of them. Uh, so therefore, to balance out the charge on the lead, four chlorides must exist with a lead four plus. Because it's really important that when we have an ionic compound, the whole thing is charge neutral. If it has a charge ever, that does need to be indicated in the formula. This one does not. It's an ionic compound, so we know it must have a neutral charge. Therefore, lead must bring a charge of four plus. Okay, how about the following one? What if we have Fe2O3? Go ahead and pause the video and see what you think. All right, so following the same process as the previous, we see we have a transition metal that we don't necessarily know what the charge is going to be, and that would be the iron, the Fe. However, we do know the charge on oxide, right? That's a 2 minus charge. And therefore, we know that if three oxides are present, it brings a total charge of 6 minus, and therefore, to balance out that 6 minus charge, we must have 6 plus present from the irons, split between two irons. That means each one is 3 plus, and therefore we have iron 3 oxide. If you like, you can set this up as sort of a mathematical equation where we say, well, the total cation charge plus the total anion charge is equal to 0, right? That's what we know about ionic compounds is they're going to be neutral when we consider both ions. Uh, and so we can say, well, if the iron charge is x, that would be 2 times x, plus 3 times the negative 2 charge on the oxygen, again, we get that from the periodic table, equals 0. Then we simply solve and basically have done the same thing that we reasoned out previously. Okay, so as a final consideration here, we're going to think about, well, what about these polyatomic ions, multi-atom ions? Because it turns out that not all ions, particularly anions, are monatomic ions, right? Oxide, for example, O2 minus, is but a single atom, an oxygen atom that's gained two electrons and therefore has a charge of negative two. Uh, however, we also have ions that are a collection of several atoms. For example, the polyatomic ion carbonate, which is consisting of a carbon in the center and three oxygens that are bound to that carbon, covalently bound. Yet the entire structure for carbonate has a charge of two minus. And therefore, when we have carbonate, the full formula for carbonate definitely needs this 2 minus. CO3, 2 minus is part of its identity. And as a polyatomic ion, it will act the same way as a monatomic ion. It's not going to break up, right, because it's covalently bound. So within ionic compounds, we keep carbonate as a unit. But it will bring 2 minus charge as the ion in a compound. We'll take a look at one example of how that works, right? Let's take a look at, again, a similar example where we have iron hydroxide, FeOH2, indicating that we have OH, which is a polyatomic ion called hydroxide, and its identity is OH minus, right? Brings a charge of minus one. So based on this chemical formula, what is the charge on iron? And go ahead and pause the video. All right, so with our iron hydroxide, FeOH2, we know that hydroxide has a charge of minus. That's part of the hydroxide identity. And therefore, iron is going to have a charge of 2 plus. Each hydroxide brings a charge of minus 1. Therefore, iron must bring a charge of 2 plus in order to balance out these hydroxides. Finally, we could name this compound and call it iron 2 hydroxide. All right, so that is just a brief introduction or review to ionic compounds, how to say their names and their charges based on their chemical formulas, uh, as well as the distinctions between ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Uh, further on in this activity, we'll work a bit more on naming and really learning how to identify ionic versus covalent compounds. 
so please complete the activities below.